These days, modding the PlayStation 2 has progressed so far that you can now play games from solid state media using a special memory card without ever having to touch a soldering iron to the console. However, there was a time when putting in a mod chip was your only option, and they are challenging to install. These days, mod chipping a PS2 has almost become a lost art form. So in today's video, we're going to see if it's still worth using a mod chip nowadays in your PlayStation 2. Hey everyone, how's it going? My name is Tito, and welcome to another episode of Retro Renew. Today we'll be installing a mod chip into this absolutely gorgeous ceramic white SEPH 50000 fat model PS2. And the chip we'll be using is the Mars Pro GM806 HD. Now back in the early 2000s, during the heyday of PS2 mod chips, there were a ton that came into existence to combat Sony's ever persistent cracking down of modders. Now, I never delved into the PS2 mod chip scene myself, however, it does have an extensive history. Thankfully, I had the help of none other than Modsville USA, who was a real wealth of knowledge on the subject and was super kind and sent over not only the Mars chip, but also this Matrix Infinity. Modsville was absolutely crucial in bringing me up to speed on PS2 mod chipping, so definitely check out his YouTube channel and follow him on Twitter where he often posts about his modding endeavors. He also has a web store where he sells these PS2 mod chips, amongst other cool products, and also provides modding services. I'll have links to all of his information down below. Anyway, you may be asking, Tito, why would I ever want to install a mod chip when we have easier soft mod alternatives like Free McBoot? Well, before we open that can of worms, let me first show you how to install a mod chip, and then I'll go over the reasons right after. Now, like I said previously, I'll be installing this Mars Pro chip but I just don't want to simply wire it up willy-nilly. Installing a PS2 mod chip has sort of become an art form and there are amazingly cool ways to install them. Now, one of the ways involves routing the wires in a very neat and unique fashion. A really talented individual named Paul of Retro Gaming Arts has really perfected this art form. So I'll be doing my best to replicate his techniques. So without any further ado, let's install this mod chip. All right. First order of business is we gotta tear this PS2 down to its motherboard. Now, depending on the variation of your particular console, this process will be different. This is an SEPH 50,000 model from Japan, which has eight screws on the bottom securing the shell. Other models have 10 screws securing the shell, while the slim models are vastly different. Now, since installing a mod chip will vary depending on what variation of the PS2 you are using, as well as the mod chip that you're installing, I'll just be providing some tips as I show the installation process. This won't necessarily be a step-by-step -step guide, so sit back, relax, and enjoy the video. This board here is the power supply, so definitely take care when handling it and try not to touch any of the components, especially the large capacitor, which could potentially hold a very large charge. So here you can see that I have a GH26 motherboard, which is a V10 system. These are actually fairly uncommon. First thing I'm gonna do is replace the CR2032 clock battery with a fresh one, since this one has long lost its charge. So the first thing I'll be soldering to is the BIOS chip. This is where the majority of the wiring stems from. This requires some fine soldering technique, especially when welding directly to the chip legs. Just take your time and double check that you are soldering to the correct points. Mm -hmm. 
Once the wires have all been soldered in place, I'll begin to shape and route them. This is a somewhat tedious process and does take time, but this is where the creativity comes into play. Since I'm using 30 gauge Kynar wire, it does tend to hold its position fairly well. I'm using some tweezers also to help separate and organize the wires to make them lay flat on the motherboard. Once they're in a good position, I use some Loctite super glue to hold them down, with this being the results. Now on the back of the motherboard, I'll be tackling the optical drive controls. These vias are covered by the solder mask, so I'll be using a narrow file to expose the vias. You can also use a craft knife, but just be sure to take your time and be delicate with the vias. You don't want to damage them. Once you're done, go ahead and tin them up. And then solder a wire to each of the designated vias. After some more wire management, this is what we're left with. Here, I'm placing the Mars Pro right underneath the BIOS. All of our wires will be soldered to this chip. Here I'm adding some more glue as I route the BIOS wires to the Mars Pro chip. Then I cut the wires to length and solder them to their designated pads on the mod chip. Cutting the wires as short as possible leaves you with a very nice aesthetic but very little room for error. Before committing, make sure you are soldering to the correct pad. And this is the final result. The rest of the wiring is just rinse and repeating the same process. And here's how everything looks all wired up. Before we reassemble the PS2, it's always a good idea to insulate the mod chip with some Kapton tape to prevent any potential shorts. And now all that's left to do is to put the console back together.
So after all that hard work, we have a PS2 modded with a Mars Pro chip, and it doesn't work. When I was installing the Mars Pro chip, I actually thought it would be a good time to install another mod while everything was disassembled. I'll be going over that mod in another video, but long story short, I soldered a wire to the wrong leg on this voltage regulator, which most likely fried something, causing the DVD drive to not function. So I did what any sane person would do, and I modded another PS2. This time a V9 motherboard as opposed to the V10 that I did initially. The fundamentals of the mod are exactly the same, but the BIOS chip along with some of the other components are arranged differently on the board, making the wire routing just a bit different. Regardless, now that we have the mod working, what can it do? Well, not so fast. Before I get ahead of myself, I have to say that even though this mod was installed correctly, it is not fully functional, which brings me to one of the first issues with mod chips, especially if you buy them nowadays. A lot of these mods are clones of older chips, so by and large, documentation for these are hard to come by and are often buried deep within forums. Modsville USA was able to dig up some information on the Mars Pro chip and found that it's supposed to be compatible with nearly all model PS2s. So when some of the functions didn't work, like the BIOS menu that we're supposed to have access to, I thought that perhaps I messed up the installation. Thankfully, Motsville was able to duplicate the same results that I had when he installed the same chip into the same model FAT PS2. Now, on the other hand, Motsville was able to get the Mars chip working 100% on his 70,000 and 90,000 slim model consoles. So, if you want to install a Mars Pro chip, your best bet is to do so in a slim model. And to add to the overall complexity of things to consider, there are multiple revisions of the Mars Pro, as with many of the other mod chips, with slightly different features and compatibility. So definitely be sure you do your research before choosing a mod chip and try to make sure it is fully compatible with your model PS2 before committing to purchasing it. All right, with all that out of the way, let's finally get into the features of this chip that are actually working. So like I said, even though the Mars Pro chip isn't fully functional, it does most of what it's supposed to do. The most important of which is playing import PS1 and PS2 games. This is one of the main reasons to install a mod chip into your PS2, to have the ability to play authentic, physical copies of imported games. Now, I should have mentioned this earlier in the video, but my working modded PS2 is an American unit. The one I modded first was a Japanese model. Installing this mod into either of these consoles gives the same exact results. And just for clarification, I swapped the working American modded PS2 motherboard into the ceramic white shell because it is just so good looking. Anyway, installing a Mars Pro in a Japanese console allows you to play North American games, and installing one in a North American console allows you to play Japanese games. So the way this mod works is simple. Just put in a PS2 game, doesn't matter the region, and then boot up the console. Here you can see I'm putting in the game Initial D, which also happens to be one of my favorite animes. You just gotta love that Eurobeat. Anyway, Initial D was not released in the US, so you would need either a Japanese PS2 or a modded PS2 like this one in order to play it. Now you can of course also play American games and you don't need to do anything special. The mod chip auto detects the region of the disc and plays the game accordingly. So not only does this mod chip allow you to play imported PS2 games, but also imported PS1 games. In order to play a PS1 game, it requires you to do something a little bit different. After inserting a PS1 game disc, again, it doesn't matter the region, you need to press the reset button twice. This puts the console into PS1 mode. After that, the console will load the PS1 game, again, auto detecting the region to allow the game to run. And that's it. Those are the main features of this kit. If you ask me, I think it is so awesome to be able to natively play American and imported games from a single console. And using a mod chip is really the most elegant way to do it. Now usually, mod chips don't play nice with soft mods like Free McBoot. However, for whatever reason, this Mars Pro chip works just fine with it. In a sense, I have the best of both worlds. I can play a bunch of PS2 games loaded on my hard drive, 
and I can play physical copies of American and Japanese imported games. It's like having the ultimate PS2. Now that isn't to say that you can't run homebrew with a mod chip only. You actually can run homebrew files like OPL without free McBoot while using a mod chip. But it isn't as convenient to set up and honestly it deserves its own video to go over it. The fact that I can simply use free McBoot with this Mars chip is awesome. Now one of the last features that I haven't tested personally is the ability to play burned backups of your games. According to Modsville, his Mars chip modded Slim PS2 supports this without any issues. Which now brings me into the pros and cons segment of this video. Starting with the pros, and speaking about mod chips in general and not just my Mars chip, they are a great way to seamlessly play import games and backups. I think it is really awesome to be able to just pop in a Japanese PS1 or PS2 game and just have it run. And lastly, there's something that's oddly satisfying by taking the time to install this chip in a PS2. I know it's not something that we can see once it's installed, but knowing it's there just gives me a warm and fuzzy. Anyway, those are some of the pros, but now let's get into the cons. I think the most obvious con here is the difficulty of installing the chip itself. This is definitely one of the more challenging mods you can do to a PS2, especially if you try to get fancy with the wire management like I did. Additionally, documentation on some of these chips aren't readily available in a centralized location, often requiring some digging in old forums, and sometimes resorting to the Wayback Machine to find long dead forum threads to shed some light on some of these chips. And the last con is that most of the chips available today are clones of the original, so you really do need to make sure you get them from a reputable vendor and that they are confirmed to work with your specific PS2 model. So overall, I think installing a mod chip is one of the coolest things you can do to the PS2. While they are challenging to install, they are also one of the most rewarding mods that you can accomplish. I have to say that I am sort of addicted to this style of PS2 modding, and I'm sure I'll be doing another one here soon enough. Anyway, what do you all think? Do any of you have any experience with mod chipping a PS2? If so, which one, and what PS2 revision did you install it in? Let us all know down below in the comments. And as always, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you all next Thursday.